So next and last but not least for the session, I'm going to introduce Christoph, who is going to speak about APIs from consumption to contribution. He's also asked me to ask a question of everybody listening. And if you know about um, social practice theory, would you please say so in the chat? OK, so um, Christoph, can we have your slides up? Uh, they should be up. Yep. Okay. That looks good. And um, okay. I'm going to turn the stage over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Lona. Happy to be here. So um, good afternoon, evening, morning, whatever, however, wherever you're watching this from. Um, uh, thank you for joining this talk. Uh, I hope I'll be able to share something new with you and some, something that will help you in your API practice uh, and your API program at large. Um, uh, it's it's a little bit of a well, it's it's a new topic also for me. It's it, but it's something that is part of a bunch of concepts that I've been like digging away at in the last couple of um, couple of months or year year and a half or something like that. And um, it's part of a, a set of topics that I was exploring at the API Resilience podcast, uh, which is a, a podcast we started very shortly after. You know, we we saw that um, you know COVID was actually going to become a pandemic, um, and uh, where we've been interviewing a bunch of different practitioners from uh, the API community on a couple of topics. And one of the topics that I'm the most excited about um, is uh, complexity and um, uh, systems thinking and and things like that, and how those apply to. Um, how we're changing our organizations uh, to be able to benefit really from, uh, take all the benefits from an API program. And I had a whole bunch of topics I wanted to cover. Um, there was a, some of them are here. Um, uh, it was, but it was just too much. Uh, I, like I, I was trying to put all of this into a single presentation. It just didn't work. So in the end, I decided to take um, the yarn approach <laughs> and uh, to, to not to try to unravel the whole ball, ball of yarn and to like start making a sweater from all of it, but just to focus on a single topic and then provide uh, hooks into different topics uh, off from that, uh, that hopefully I'll be able to explore later in, in pre, um, new talks or, or maybe also on the podcast. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in any of this stuff, just uh, come and check out the podcast. So, but without further ado, uh, what I wanted to talk about, uh, and uh, thank you, Lona, for asking the audience uh, to say um, uh, who, who's heard about this. Uh, but what I want to ask about is like, who's heard about social practice theory? Um, and uh, social practice theory is, is um, a formalized way of thinking about what it takes for people to start using, um, you know, to, to, to start doing a certain practice. Um, it's, it's been used in contexts like, you know, how do you get people to take the medicine that they've been prescribed? Um, because one thing is, um, you know, having your medicine at home, a whole other thing is actually taking it in time. And uh, what they found was that when they used this theory uh, to, um, to explore the concepts and to, to look at the different angles um, that they'd helped to, to improve um, um, the rate at which people were taking um, their medicines. Uh, practically, it talks about three components. Uh, and, and this is my drawings. Um, my colleagues would do a much better job. Um, but um, I'm, I'm sure they're going to curse me for <laughs> not asking them. Um, but that's, um, yeah, that's for the next version of this talk. But um, uh, basically, there's three components. There's competency. Uh, there's the tool, obviously, and uh, the meaning. And I'll, what all that means, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Um, maybe one thing, though, is that uh, in social practice theory, the tool is normally uh, referred to as material. But because we're talk going to be talking about APIs, I thought that was not really appropriate. And I, I figured it would be better um, to talk about tools rather than materials. Um, first, very short. Very short thing, like why am I talking about this topic? Uh, I'm Christoph Antoma, I'm CEO of Pronovix. Um, in my free time, I do things like this, which is um, basically um, a blueberry field that I'm trying to build in the backyard. I'm, I'm a bioengineer by education, so I'm always looking for like connections between the biological world and the technological world, like ecosystem thinking and, and, and stuff like that. Um, one day I'll 
I'll tell the stories from the, the, the backyard stories uh, also, <laughs> but that's that's for another time. Um, I, I yeah, my company is Pronovix. We do developer portals, um, but you know, enough about that. Um, I am here to talk about social practice theory. So when I'm going to be talking about tools uh, um, represented by this bird's nest. Um, uh, um, in your heads, replace it with whichever of the following uh, APIs, API gateways, or developer portals, whichever you know, you're currently thinking about adopting and, and you, maybe you're struggling adopting. And, um, and you can replace them at will, and then later I'll, I'll make it a little bit more specific. Um, but where, where I want to get started is this uh, tool utopia trap. And I'm sure this is not news for you, um, but I still I want to kind of like highlight it because I think it's an essential part um, to the reason why I thought it would be useful to talk about social practice theory. One thing I've seen over and over again um, in the API space is this, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy this tool and it's going to solve my problem for me. Like I've, I've heard some organizations that, you know, they'll, they'll, they've, I, I once I talked with an organization and they were using their third API gateway. So they've implemented the first one, it wasn't working. So they've implemented the second one, it wasn't working. And now they were doing their third implementation. And that's kind of madness, right? Um, because it kind of like assumes that the problem really was um, the technology and it was the tool rather than the things around it. And this, but this is a very often uh, like this is a very common misconception, and um, like I'm guilty of this stuff. Like I've got a, uh, we've got a closet full of board games at home, and some of them I've, I've actually haven't played yet. Um, and uh, even though that I would love to play this game together with with my kids, um, it, it just hasn't. We, we just haven't gotten to actually doing the practice of playing the game, and. Um, and, and I think that the key question when you're thinking about adopting a tool rather than just, you know, I'm just going to use this strategy to get my job done is to think about what is it that you're trying to achieve with this tool? What is the product promise that you've bought? Because if you really think about it, you'll see that the product promise you've bought, uh, and that can be about for an API, um, an API gateway, dev portal could, could be for for or could be uh, for um, API monoliths or or for uh, API microservices. Um, is uh, that you'll see that the underlying promise cannot be fulfilled by the tool in itself. It's a set of practices that will have to be done on top of the tool using the tool as leverage that will help get you to the state where you want to be or the, the the promise that will. To, to fulfill the promise that that uh, you've made yourself when you bought this tool. It's, so it's only through new, the, the use of new practices or, or maybe of, of, of um, more intensified use of certain existing practices that you can achieve, achieve the product outcome uh, that has been promised. And to be able to do that, um, um, you'll need uh, you know, to, to do certain practices, but you also need certain competencies. So the second question I think you should be asking when you're using a new tool is, what competences, see, uh, what competencies will we need to be able to achieve the outcome that what we want to achieve? And uh, sometimes, sometimes these competencies can be very trivial. And and actually, this is I think part of the reason why we have this tool utopia trap, is that uh, we've gotten used to commoditized tools that are so embedded in our social structure that they've become so obvious that we don't even realize anymore that we need certain competencies to be able to use them. Uh, sometimes though, um, these competencies that are needed to be to be really successful with the tool are hidden. Like, for example, um, I've talked with a lot of uh, teams about how they do documentation. And one of the things that almost always comes up uh, is that a lot of organizations have um, are using wikis uh, like Typically, it's like Confluence Wiki, and uh, for for their internal documentation. And then I asked them, like, so how is this going? Like, how how do you like it? And almost always, the answer is, well, actually, it's not that good. Like, we've got problems with versioning. We've got problems with this and that. And and but I had once one team that said, no, actually, 
Confluence is fantastic. And, and this works really well for us. And I said, oh, so how come? And, and basically they said, well, we have a team of people. We've got two people. Their whole job is Confluence gardening. They're spending a lot of time just cleaning up stuff, making sense of stuff, architecting information, um, asking people to, inf like, to update information, stuff like that. And they were really successful with Confluence. So the problem is not the tool, it's the, the, the practices and the capabilities that might be missing uh, around the tool. Um, another example is, is um, in, uh, in developer portal space, uh, the space that we work in. Um, uh, typically, uh, the teams, when they come to us asking for a developer portal, uh, typically we will have a product owner and API developers in the team, but we won't have technical writers and we won't have developer advocates. Uh, well, actually, and, and I'll come to this in a moment, actually to be really successful with, um, with a developer portal, you probably need some technical writing to be done because you need to think about the information architecture. Uh, you need good documentation, else your developer experience will not that be that great. And you, you probably, if you really want to be serious about becoming successful with your APIs, you probably need developer advocate. Um, um, and most teams don't don't have those roles, those capabilities um, in in uh, their team. Um, but I talked a little bit about the developer advocate thing, and um, and and actually that is a lead-in into the third part of uh, the capability, uh, the um, the social practice uh, theory model, and that's meaning, um, because if you think about it, like where why do birds have nests like they're it's not like they grow nests or something that it's you know they build nests and they all do it why do they do that how come how do they through the 60 million years that they've been in existence how have they retained or built out this capability and how come that almost every bird is doing this thing and I think that the reason why is, is uh, and it's an interesting uh, connection with the, so, the, the human side of things, is that there's a shared social meaning in nests. And nests are a social construct for birds that has meaning um, in between different individuals. There's a lot of words, but basically there's different things that birds do using nests that connect them with other birds. Um, uh, you know, you lay your egg in the nest, um, mate selection might happen around the nest, like the previous picture. Child rearing will happen in the nest, which means that the next generation starts their life in a nest. All of these things create a shared meaning, a shared social meaning that is not just inside of one bird. It's a shared social meaning in between birds that is genetically encoded um, through these practices that connect, uh, that are connected to this. And this is why all these practices are. Um, reinforcing this shared meaning that is reinforcing the individual practices because of which uh, they're much more stable than if you would have just a single practice um, with you know a singular purpose. And it's very similar how um, social practice works in in human systems, um, where um, but the interesting thing is that in human systems um, social meaning is culturally encoded. Um, we have a couple of them that are genetically encoded. But most of our practices are culturally encoded. And, um, and that, that changes a lot of things. Now, here's a first yarn ball moment. There's a really interesting story about the parallels and the difference between uh, how this information is encoded and how this all works um, uh, between human and animal society. Um, would love to philosophize about it, but that's not for now. Um, instead, I want to talk a little bit about shared meaning. Because for us, uh, shared meaning uh, happens when different people um, start developing an understanding about a certain topic that they share. And this is very similar to how language works. Um, you know, language, you know, a single human with language that's just a code is just a, a tool for encoding information. Language really happens when there's multiple humans that are using the same language to connect to each other and to build shared meanings. And, and the shared meanings for social practices are very similar. Um, 
This also connects to this other concept that is very similar, uh, affordances. Um, and I've, uh, I've been looking for the perfect uh, UX door, or, I, I, uh, well, or the, the most imperfect UX door, uh, where you can, like, you're not really sure how you open this door. Um, so this is a really bad example of, of uh, UX, or, or, you know, because the affordances of this door is not clear. Um, but um, an affordance is uh, a capability that is attached to a product that um, people have gotten used to so that it has become a social technical construct. So you need stuff in people's heads that they know that they can do something with a certain tool and you need the tool um, uh, together to create an affordance. And this is really, really interesting stuff. Again, this is a, a ball of yarn. Um, uh, I had this talk with Michael Haibe. Uh, he, he did this tweet about affordance catalogs and how we should have affordance catalogs rather than API or service catalogs. And um, he came onto the podcast. We had a long conversation about what, what, do, what is it really that an affordance is and, and all of that stuff. Really, really interesting thing. But um, that's too much for, for now. Actually, I'm still digesting it and thinking about how do you actually practically do an affordance catalog? Because it's not that obvious. Um, but I think um, uh, there's some really, really interesting stuff here that we need to understand to, to bring the industry forward. So social practice, competence tool, meaning. Um, what does this mean for APIs and developer portals? First of all, when you build an API or when you build a developer portal or when you have an API management tool um, or whatever other tool that you're using, uh, somebody will have to maintain it. And uh, this is maybe a little bit less obvious because we're used to embodied tools like a hammer or something like that, that don't need all that much maintenance. In fact, maybe you can just use it until it's broken and then throw it away. But um, with software um, uh, that is living in this really turbulent world, um, you, you can't afford to, to not have maintenance and to, to not continue to develop uh, your products because they all start decaying and they'll, you know, you'll start hack, being hacked and stuff like that. So maintenance practices are really important in the software world, especially with APIs, because APIs are even more abstract than software. Um, so they're even more vulnerable when humans stop caring. Um, and um, uh, the, the interesting thing here, though, is that um, you can have, and here's how we get to the title of this presentation. To be able to have an API consumption practice where you're using an API, you also need an API production practice um, where a team is, um, <clears throat> is producing the APIs that will be uh, consumed um, by other people. Which means that these tools, these interfaces, and you know, application program interfaces, Actually, these tools are interfaces between two groups of people. And I actually, if there's one thing you should remember from this talk is that whenever you are looking at an API, you should be thinking about two sets of people. That you, you, know, you cannot look at a tool without thinking about both the people that will use it and the people that will build it. Um, if you think about the tool without people, you're probably gonna make the mistake. You're gonna step into the tool trap. Um, it's the people that make tools work and, um, and you need both sides of the interface to do so. And um, uh, practically that means that um, you should be thinking about the tool almost like this sub thing or like this, um, like a cell uh, separated from the rest of the, uh, like from the other parts um, of the equation um, um, through an interface inside of which uh, there's, again, a group of people that are creating shared meaning about what the tool is supposed to do. Um, maybe that meaning is shared with the people that are consuming APIs, but not necessarily, because people that are consuming APIs might have completely different ideas uh, that have certain sets of competencies that have their own tools to, to be able to build this API. Um, and then there's the API consumption practice where there's this other group of people that have shared meaning that have these competencies and that are using uh, you know, the API and maybe a couple of other tools uh, to, to have this practice of using that API. And this opens up another kind of really interesting worms, which is complexity theory. Um, um, because the moment you involve people into something, the moment that you know, 
you are introducing complex adaptive systems because we are probably the epitome of complex adaptive systems that are um, you know, kind of unpredictable with a whole bunch of properties. There's lots and lots of interesting theories and very interesting concepts, but that's a, another ball of yarn. I've tried to connect it a little bit with uh, Wardley mapping and the Cinefin framework for something that could be maybe complexity mapping, but I'm still chewing on it. Um, but that's that's uh, one of those other topics that I'd love to explore in a future talk. But then the, the role of the developer portal in this whole story is that um, I believe that just like the team that builds the API helps with the tool, I believe that the role of the developer portal is to help with the creation of shared meaning, where you are um, uh, both creating documentation and publishing documentation, but also have like some interaction to help uh, people form a mental model of what your APIs do both individually and in, in combination with other APIs that you have. Like, what is it actually that you can do with this? And I think that is leading towards that affordance catalog that Michael was talking about. Um, but again, in the Dev Portal team, you'll again, you'll need a shared meaning about what is it exactly that we're trying to do. You need the tool, you need the competencies. So what can we do other, beside all of this stuff that I've mentioned uh, before uh, with this model? What can What is this useful for? I think, when, like in the future, when you start thinking about using a tool, the first thing to do is to think about what is the product promise that is being made here? Or what promise am I making to myself? And then what competencies will I need to be able uh, to actually use this tool? And what practices will I be able, will I need to do to actually be successful um, to achieve this product promise? And then last but not least, how will we build shared meaning between the people that are supposed to be using this tool so that we'll be able to, to effectively uh, implement the practices uh, that are necessary. And that highlights a really important uh, difference between internal and external developer portals because in an internal API program, um, it's a little bit easier because you have a, a, a protected context, you have a protected group of people that's a little bit easier to influence about how they should be thinking, even though that is not that easy because uh, business analysts have been trying to build domain models for a very long time and, and it's not that straightforward. Um, but maybe you will also might want to use an internal developer advocate. And on the external side, in the external API program, um, you need to think about developer relations program and external developer advocates to help with this. And then in summary, to conclude my presentation, basically, um, you know, don't just take the product promise for granted. Um, uh, whatever, whenever you want to fulfill a product promise, you need to have certain practices in place to be able to do so. And you also need to think about the practice of maintenance, especially with software. And then last but not least, um, um, you need some way of creating the shared meaning. Uh, so if you create an API program, how are you going to make people understand where they can find the right API and things like that. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. And um, if you want to unravel this ball of yarn together with me, uh, I would like to invite you to uh, our newsletter where we'll be publishing some of this stuff uh, or to uh, the API Resilience podcast uh, where um, I've gotten conversations about topics like this. Thank you very much. Welcome back, Ilona. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. That was really interesting. And I have a few questions for you. So I'm glad there's a few minutes. Um, first of all, when, you, when you're thinking about tools, do you recommend buying a tool or developing one in house? Like what would be the better way to reach the goal? Well, I think the, the key is that um, this is where wordly mapping is interesting because wordly mapping uh, gives you a tool for reasoning about when to buy and when not to buy. Um, and like at what level, I, I think the essence is that if you're really close to your users, you probably need more customization than if it's something that's further away from your customers. So for example, um, uh, I would not recommend building your own API management solution. Don't do that. That's crazy. Um, um, uh, but if you're building a, like if you need a developer portal, this is very close to your customers. So, um, and this is what we do. We, we, we customize a productized platform uh, so that it will address the, the exact needs of uh, individual customers. Um, because you're very close, like 
the value there is much higher and you're much closer to, to your customers. And it's important to be able to build something that's right for your audience. Um, and and same, same with APIs, like um, probably, you know, if this is a core business, you probably should be thinking about building your own APIs. Um, but it's it, it depends. There needs to be enough business value. And you also need to look at like, uh, what is already available in the markets and how commoditized are those uh, tools? Um, and is there some way to like add your own custom flavor on top of the existing tools? Okay, something people you know bemoan about the modern world is that things are not made to last. Yes. You know, like I have kitchen totally. implements for, that were my grandmother's and they're in great shape. But if I went out today and I bought a whisk, it would be designed to fall apart in a couple of years. Yes. So is there a point where you do say, you know what, maintenance is too expensive. I need to replace this. And what what would what, what factors go into that decision? Uh, interesting question. I think I think the reason for replacing stuff is because we are buying that products. Um uh, because we have created this industrialized tool culture where the implements that we're buying are no longer modifiable and repairable, which means that maintenance has become impossible. Um, which the big advantage is that that also means that some of the practices that you would normally have to do to be able to keep using a tool uh, are no, lo no longer necessary. Um, but... Um, yeah, it, it's not. I personally, I, I especially considering what's going on in the the environment and so on. Um, I think we need to rethink this. I think I think it's 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 the same th same problem with the the internet of um, um, crap, <laughs> or you know the as well that that um, we we are building tools where there's the implicit promise that this is going to keep working and then it doesn't. And it's really, really annoying. Um, so I, I believe, well, I hope that we can change some of this. Um, but yeah, that good, really good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for your very thoughtful talk. I now know that I personally need to do some more reading about um, the Cinefin framework because that was new to me. Oh, and that's I really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Really um, I wish I could let you talk more, but I need to wrap <laughs> up the session. And so thank you to all the speakers and thank you for everybody for attending. This has been really great and I wish everybody a great conference. Thank you very much. Bye everyone and, and stay safe. Yes, that too. <laughs> get, get your vaccine if you don't have one yet. Yeah. <laughs>